Thank you for joining session A, infusing DEI into a new medical cur curriculum. Today, we're going to use automated Zoom captions during the live event, and we will edit the recording transcripts before we share them with you to be more accurate. At the bottom of the Zoom window, you should see a closed captions button. You will see live transcription Underneath that button, select that to turn on and off as you prefer. Please pose your questions using the chat function. That will moderate and discuss with our panels. Towards the end of the hour, we'll share how you can continue the conversation online and share some additional resources to support your teaching. I'd like to now be able to welcome to this panel, uh, Drs. Valerie Cadet, Stacy Fairley and Douglas uh, Koch. Uh, go ahead and take it away. I think that David, um, Douglas, I think that you're first. Yes, Probably. yes, thank you, Monica, for the introduction. Move to the next slide. So um, today, um, this is our agenda. We're going to start with a welcome, um, followed by learning outcomes, um, communicating the importance of DEI, and uh, identifying opportunities the new curriculum at our institution, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and then we'll have an open, an open discussion. So I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Valerie Cadet. Um, I'm the director of Health Equity Curricular Initiatives. And, and you know, in a little bit, I'll actually uh, delve just into what that, what that really means. I'm also an associate professor of microbiology and immunology. And I am based at the PCOM, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, Georgia campus in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, and I'm Dr. Stacy Fairley. I'm the Director of Interprofessional Education and also uh, recently um, promoted Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology. And I am located at the PCOM South Georgia campus, which is in Moultrie, Georgia. And hello, my name is Douglas Koch, Dr. Douglas Koch. I'm the Associate Director of Teaching and Learning at the Philadelphia campus of PCOM. And um, it's nice to meet everybody. So we've just got three uh, learning outcomes that we hope that you all can walk away with. And, you know, it starts with just being able to communicate the importance of DEI. We're going to talk about DEI in healthcare specifically, but it, it, essentially being able to communicate the importance and necessity to have DEI integrated into, into your curriculum at your institution is, is really our goal. Um, as well as helping hopefully to identify opportunities to incorporate DEI content within the curriculum itself. And then rounding out with um, how to initiate the DEI assessment and truly evaluate this as a program. So I'm going to talk about um, the importance of diversity, the importance of diversity in medical education as far as gender and sexual orientation is concerned. Um, with just some some stats here. So um, in 2020, a Gallup poll was done. And there was a uh, marked increase in the number of people who are identifying as LGBT. Um, so it's up now to 5.6%. Um, on the downside, there are a lot of health disparities associated with the community, which I belong to. Um, so there's due to a lot of societal factors, uh, there are health disparities related to um, higher rates of mental health and um, substance abuse. There's also um, access to healthcare um, issues as well. Um, people are not, um, don't have as much access to insurance um, that's changing, thankfully due to um, the Supreme Court decision that took place recently, um, just um, pro prohibiting people from being um, fired for being or identifying as LGBT. But um, unfortunately, these health disparities do still exist, and there are um, new laws coming out that are still making it difficult for people to access health care. And... 
And so I'm going to talk about the disparities that we saw, and particularly when the pandemic hit, we saw these racial disparities in our healthcare system. Um, and it was really highlighted during that time. And so the pandemic really truly laid bare some uncomfortable truths truth about disparities in the healthcare system. And what we saw was that originally, um, initially information was only being given out in English and a large population, uh, millions of American citizens uh, identify English as not their being their, their native language. Additionally, the pandemic exacerbated the systemic racism and racial disparities that we saw in the healthcare system. Next slide. So this tells us to look at what we're being, what we're teaching in our curriculum, right? So um, something that's really missing from the curriculum when you look at DEI and curriculum is the teaching of racial disparities. Now, throughout medical school, um, uh, throughout a student's medical school matriculation, they may see a chart like this. No matter what the topic that they're learning about, whether it's breast cancer, diabetes, COPD. It's always a long conversation about the pathophysiology um, behind these things. And then the last few minutes, you'll throw, a, you'll throw a slide up like this. And then there's no explanation about the context behind it. So most of the minorities might uh, know that the context behind this because we grew up in communities that were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. But most of our peers don't know that. And so instead of uh, this information being perceived as something um, that should be well known, what our peers may perceive it as is that, oh, uh, minorities need to be pathologized, um, which means that they're genetically predisp uh, predisposed to having experiences like this. But disparities um, with this data coming out in regard with COVID-19 um, it needed to be more transparent. You needed to really take a, deep, a deeper dive and understand the systemic racism that built for these numbers to be presented this way. So nationwide, Black Americans have experienced about 15.7% of all the COVID deaths. Um, and then they represent, we represent about 12.4% of the population. So why are we seeing these numbers? Next slide. So you may recognize that um, recognize these images from the COVID-19 mitigation activities um, are actions that were asked to be um, that were asked of us in order to slow the spread of the virus. So when they started discussing social distancing, who did not have the privilege of social distance? The essential workers. And when you start to look at who was disproportionately affected or represented the essential workers, people of color um, make up the majority of the essential workers in the food and agriculture industry. I think that's around 50%. And then when you look at industrial, commercial, residential facilities and other services, we make up about 53%. So nearly 70% of the essential workers um, also did not have college degrees. So they were more than likely less, um, less likely um, not in management positions. So they did not have the healthcare benefits. They could not take pay uh, sick leave off. And then when you start to look at conversations around hand washing and things of that nature, did they think about the incarcerated population where a large minor minority of uh, population of people are incarcerated. So now you they don't have access to running water and things of that nature. And then, when you look at social distancing, most of minority um, households are multi-generational households. And so you can't social distance when your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunts and uncles all live together. So now this data starts to make sense that you see high numbers of deaths and hospitalizations when it comes to minorities because of the historical context that's behind it. But without teaching the historical context, then you only think that minorities don't want to social distance, they want to spread the virus. And then when you look at vaccination, next slide, you also think that minorities don't want to be vaccinated. So when you look at this here, you say to yourself, okay, the vaccination, when it originally, when the vaccination um, originally came out, it needed to be rolled out in the infrastructure in, the, in communities that had the infrastructure. And we're talking about places like pharmacy clinics and hospitals that make convenient um, that make convenient sites for the vaccine to be administered. 
But when you go back to the historical aspect, and especially when you look at medical racism and things like redlining, where um, you had different businesses that were just not uh, placed in these minority communities, and you look at um, even slavery and things of that nature and the mistrust that occurred uh, you can see why these numbers start to make sense and things of that nature. So in a lot of Southern states, what they saw was that the placement of these vaccination sites were in predominantly white neighborhoods. Next slide. So you can see here, in, and I just picked a, a few of them from this paper that I was reading. In Baton Rouge, you had, um, and the purple is predominantly white, and then the orange is predominantly minority neighborhoods. You see that most of the circles where the vaccination sites are in the predominantly white, and that, that is because the infrastructure was there. So when you go back to that main slide where it says that the vaccination rates are low in minority communities, now all of this, as I stated, starts to make sense. But when you're up, when you're standing in front of your students and you're teaching this, you're only talking about the numbers. And you have to start to give the historical context to that in order to, for the students to truly have a holistic view of why this is occurring and how they can change it. So what is your DEI focus? So what I want you guys to do is either use the Padlet or you can put it in the chat what your DEI focus is. And while you do that, I was just taking a look and I see, you know, um, thank you for those of you who have put where you're from in the um, Padlet. You know, right now we're of course from medical school. We've got um, STEM librarian, learning librarian from University of North Florida. We've got um, San Francisco State University Department of English represented and um, community colleges of Spokane instructional design. And hopefully the, the rest of you maybe can, can let us know where you're from too. Just had to interject there, Stacy. Thank you. I love knowing where people are from. And so, you know, we're, I just wanted to pause, we wanted to pause for a moment. We'll come back and as we see things pop up, you know, we'll, we'll be able to um, come back to it. And I think as, as Doug mentioned at the end, we'll have some Q and A. So keep putting your comments. Next slide. What I, I wanted to really uh, talk with you about was a bit on our approach, right? And, and some of our curricular change. So what you're looking at, first of all, is our um, locations. Um, if you can just hit enter the next couple, like two more times, I think. <laughs> there you go. Um, and we have three campuses. Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine has been around since the end of the 1800s. I can't really remember what year offhand, but that's a long time. We've got our history, but that main campus is in Philadelphia. We've got a branch campus, which is where I am, um, which has been around since about 2005. And that campus is in North Metro Atlanta. Um, and it was designed where to, or the goal was to um, help meet the needs of the South um, because it was recognized that there was a, a lack of physicians um, in comparison to the North. Then you've got the Moultrie, Georgia campus, which is in South Georgia where Dr. Fairley is. And, um, you know, the, the challenge here is that First of all, the majority of our students at each respective campus are coming from the region, the greater region of, of that respective campus. And when you're talking about Georgia, you know, the Moultrie campus has, you know, students from uh, a lot of students from the more rural parts of Georgia, because Georgia's, you know, pretty rural, um, a large part of it, while the, the Suwannee Georgia campus is, um, you know, has the majority of our students from the region itself. So, Ultimately, the big thing is that we've got students that are learning from regions that are urban and learning um, within that region, suburban, specifically um, in this southern north uh, uh, Georgia, metro Atlanta region. You know, we're really interesting here um, in that we have this 
majority minority county um, in Gwinnett County. It's the largest in Georgia itself. You've got people from all over the globe in this, in this small region um, and it's highly populated. It's very, very diverse in all types of ways, but it's also very siloed. You know, and then you've got, um, you know, to contrast that, the urban north and, and, you know, in urban areas, we know that it's, you know, very densely populated. Um, we've got a wide variety of medical specialties. It doesn't seem like there's a lack of, you know, health care or providers. But the catch is that the systems themselves um, are not necessarily set up in a way that really provide that equitable access. So in the urban areas, access and, and equity, health equity is, is a little different. Um, it's really more based, the lack of it, based on socioeconomic factors. Um, and then in the rural South, on top of all of the factors, you know, as Dr. Uh, Fairley mentioned and Dr. Cope earlier, there's all these different aspects, but it's even, they're even further enhanced in terms of um, risk factors for health disparities because of the geographic isolation, because of the um, uh, lower socioeconomic status of rural residents, because of the higher rates of healthy um, or, or risky health behaviors, because of the lack of access to healthcare like hospitals during COVID, a good number of rural hospitals actually closed. They condensed, ERs did. There's also a lack of specialists and subspecialists um, and limited job opportunities, which, you know, Doug all, uh, already mentioned that you've got um, certain populations that have reduced access to health insurance. And so rural residents are less likely to have health insurance through their um, employers. And so then that leaves them more uh, having to access Medicaid, but oftentimes falling in the gap. So um, go ahead and click that, sorry, three more times. Forgive the animations and Google Slides. I didn't realize it was going to be like that. So um, ultimately what it is that we're looking at is that we've got, at, with PCOM, our challenge was really that we, we've got to understand that we've got separate administrations um, they were originally administering separate curriculums that were distinct. There's a lack of diversity, of course, within administration. There's a lack of diversity in terms of faculty. And a lack, that, that diversity lack was race, it was gender, and it was lots of other aspects. And so what we really wanted to do was think about where our students were coming from. And, you know, the fact is that they were going to, that we have three populations of students, we have three extra you know communities and we really just needed to um identify those really glaring dei needs um and we had to have community buy-in because as we all know in in terms of dei there is definitely that lack of buy-in we needed it at the macro level at the administration level we needed it at the micro level right there within you know the the people that are serving our students in the classroom, out of the classroom, and within the student population themselves. They needed to understand this. Um, and I think we have a couple more clicks there, four more. And so ultimately, we had a great need for faculty development as we were thinking about you know, revising this curriculum. And we had pretty limited proactive DEI measurement tools. And so that's where we really started thinking about this assessment and evaluation. It was very clear that our unconscious biases really amongst everybody were very present and infused in the curriculum in certain ways. And, you know, we're always looking at the outcome. So we, we needed to address that. And of course, there's all these other things. You know, what are the questions in terms of DEI we didn't know? So next slide. So that led us to really developing, um, you know, one curriculum, which we then you know, essentially we said PCM1. Um, and we had to take the systems level approach. DEI had to be from the top down at every aspect. So, you know, what we did was take the best and the best from all of our separate curriculums, bring them together, combining them to and like basically have this overall synergistically delivered um, curriculum, which is delivered separately on each campus, but it's a shared curriculum. We have shared course directors across the campuses um, and, and all of them have, each of them have their separate roles, but they work together. We have for every lecture, three content experts that actually come together 
to create shared learning objectives, um, as well as shared assessment items. And so ultimately we have shared assessments. Um, you know, when we do that, we end up having this, of course, greater diversity in thought and really able to deliver to our students, you know, what they needed. So we also created a centralized administration. Um, and when I say that, no, we didn't change presidents and deans and all of that, but first of all, um, you know, they, we created a medical education center of excellence, which brought in people from all of our campuses. And, you know, we started to see this increase in diversity just in terms of that. And that's at the director level, right? So we've got representation now in terms of race and gender, age, various backgrounds, and, and really importantly, geographic locations where people are from and serving to really help inform that implementation of the new curriculum. So ultimately, you know, the systems level approach was really starting at the top and making this curricular commitment to incorporate in all of our courses an understanding of disparities in healthcare. Next, next slide. You know, how, how, what, what are the disparities that are ultimately impacting that uh, patients receiving healthcare, the allocation of healthcare resources, and then the public health issues themselves that reference the cultural, social, economic, and ethnic concerns of the people we have to serve. So as we were looking at this, all of our courses had to have enhanced DEI content um, via the clinical case scenarios, via standardized patients, encounters, um, and, and you know, how that worked out, via our interprofessional education experiences, which are pretty comprehensive themselves, and you know, including patient perspective sessions. Have patients themselves come in and inform future physicians of you know, these areas um, that are important to them, that they need the physicians to recognize and help mitigate those in unconscious bias and help raise awareness. Um, click, thank you. And so, you know, what we're looking at is, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're looking at in that um, was encouraging that culturally appropriate messaging, right? Dr. Fairley described, you know, how, you know, traditionally it's, you know, you've got all the hard sciences behind various disease presentations and clinical states, but then you would end up having, you know, the, the one little bit at the end. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the times without any context. And so, you know, we ended up having, um, you know, the, this, this oversight committee that really helps, um, first of all, give faculty information on where and how to culturally present the diversity in disease presentations, but also very importantly, um, have a, a distinction in visual imagery, right? Like various skin tones, various populations, various things, and really infuse that right within lectures, um, as well as the assessments, okay? And so additionally, what we're looking at uh, was the creation of one new course that was pretty key to this whole thing as well, called Medical Humanities. And so, you know, we want, our futures to be our future physicians to be humanistic, right? And so tying in all of you know the things that we already mentioned and discussed as challenges um, and goals, you know the goal of this particular course was to have students increase their own self awareness um, in terms of their own emotions, in terms of sub assumptions and thought processes and behavioral patterns. You know, we do it through a variety of ways. There's reflective writings, there's um, med uh, narrative medicine, and, um, you know, there's exercises and small group discussions. But ultimately, with these reflections that students do, both within the, you know, the, the set course experiences, as well as through the fact is we require them to go outside in the community, greater community, both within PCOM and, and outside, um, and serve their community and learn about the community. It could be a matter of sitting in a seminar, um, which is really geared at understanding, you know, maybe a segment of the, of the population that they have no idea about, right? Um, but just sit in there and learn. And so incentivizing that to the students in a way and having them do targeted reflective experiences really has shown that, you know, they are, they are learning to, you know, raise their own awareness, uncover their biases, and, just basically help uh, figure out what they can do to improve those negative health 
outcomes, right? There's also an emphasis on social justice and that historical perspective that we need for things to be in context. Okay, additionally, um, what we're seeing is that we had, we incorporated trainings and workshops, various lectures, and, you know, the whole point of all of this is to help not just our students, because those are things that are some of them within embedded in the curriculum in courses. Others are those extra pieces that are highly encouraged and sometimes, you know, incentivized um, for the students to attend, as well as faculty and staff in order to have microaggression training as a uh, privilege training. We've had some pretty interesting active learning in terms of privilege and health privilege and helping people understand what that looks like. And then also always maintain this focus of the historical perspective of racism itself and injustice to really help inform, okay? And so in terms of evaluation and feedback, we realized we needed some real-time feedback. We went ahead and uh, developed processes for that feedback so that students know exactly where to go and who to talk to um, to get, you know, to be able to say, okay, we need this and we need this now, or this was great, or can we have more of this? And then Doug will go on later to talk about how we enhanced our evaluation process. Click, please. And so ultimately what we're looking at is finally this intentional hiring, right? So we started to infuse diversity in uh, we have our first woman dean, um, the first in the history of the college, and she is on our campus, for instance, and that's, you know, a very big deal, but also that increased representation in terms of the uh, committee to oversee the implementation of this new curriculum, um, and then there's, you know, this intentional ongoing process of hiring to actually meet the mission um, by hiring individuals who are more diverse in terms of their background, all the different aspects that we have discussed already. So here's one more um, question uh, here that I would say, if you can go to the Padlet or you can put in the chat, you know, thinking about how do you identify opportunities to incorporate, incorporate DI content within the curriculum at your institution? You know, we spent a lot of time in, in round tables and surveys and just different types of things, but you know, the processes that I've just outlined are, are how we've been able to do it. Um, let's see if there's anything. I'm just going to check the Padlet really quickly. Um, oh, great. Thank you. I do see that there's some, some feedback um, from question one. So I'll be excited that we can take a look at that after two. Um, And helping form relationships is one key thing that I see there. So that'll be nice to um, look at that later. Okay, next slide. Sure. So, so, um, so now that we had this new curriculum in place and we worked really hard, um, we really want to know, you know, how is it effective? How are we going to um, measure that? So I think a lot of people in education are used to some traditional ways of collecting data on the effectiveness of the program. And a lot of it is quantitative. Um, you know, we have this, our assessments, we have our tests, we have our quizzes, we look at um, the final course grade, we look at how many people uh, might pass. We also do things like course evaluations, um, look to see what the students thought of the faculty, what they thought of the course in general. Um, for us, because we're a medical school, we had such things as, you know, licensing exams, we have um, boards at different, uh, phases of their um, uh, their medical education. We also look at graduation rates as well. A lot of schools do that too. Um, other types of programs also look at persistence. Um, you know, but that only gives you so much information. Um, and it's great information. But what we really want to do is is to you know in, in exploring you know our diverse learners. We really want to look at their lived experiences. So we want to do is start getting some qualitative data. So how are we going to do that? So, and what are we going to look at? So what we want to start asking is, you know, what is your opinion of the settings, the culture, the, the processes that are available? What resources do the students have access to? Things like that. Um, because that's going to give a voice to every student that participates and it will allow us to better understand what those numbers mean. 
So go to the next slide. So if you think about evaluating a system, um, you know, the first thing you would want to do is, is look at the reaction. How do the students perceive the, the environment? How do they perceive something like the physical space in the library, in the classroom? You know, the classroom's too dark. Are they too echoey? Are this, they uncomfortable? Are they too cold? Can they get to them? Can they access them? You know, what technologies are available? Again, you know, the library, what resources the libraries have for the students? Are they able to access them? Um, what about the learning management system that we use? Are they able to navigate that easily or providing the right type of training for them? Um, also, what types of services are available to the students? You know, what do they, what information do they get through admissions? Do they get through um, orientation or student affairs or financial aid? Um, what kind of availability do they have to, um, you know, faculty and staff when they need it? You know, do faculty, we're really lucky. I think we're a really unique institution. And it's just from day one, it surprised me. I've, I've never known anybody to have an office hour. Um, students can walk up to a faculty member or staff member at any time, anywhere, and they will drop what they're doing and they will engage with the students. It just, it still gives me goosebumps, but it's, um, it's really a special place that way. Um, so, you know, but not every place is like that. I understand that. And sometimes that's a barrier for students um, on top of maybe cultural barriers with, you know, seeking help or asking a question. Um, you know, also ask questions about the flow of the curriculum, the, the content delivery, how it's being done, the pacing of it, um, and, you know, what's their experience. Next, we would look at, you know, that's the foundation. Next, we would look at learning. You know, if we can't get those things in place, the students can't learn. But once they can, we can measure things such as, you know, what are their skills, their knowledge, the attitudes they're developing? How do we measure that? We can look at assessments, like I mentioned before. We use computer-based testing for most of our tests, and it's multiple choice tests. So, you know, how do students um, address, maybe a lot of students are unprepared for that type of testing. Like we mentioned before, we have a, a rural campus, suburban campus, and a, an urban campus, and our students are very different. Some of the rural students come from a different type of institution than the urban campus, and they um, maybe aren't used to multiple choice tests that might be used to the more traditional blue book. So maybe they're behind, um, not necessarily in the content or the understanding, but in the test taking skills. So, um, you know, that speaks to test validity. Um, but here we can also me measure, you know, the, the course pass rate, like I mentioned before, retention, persistence, things like that. We can also measure their skills because it's a medical school. How are they doing with their encounters with, um, you know, patients, um, standardized patients? And that brings us to behavior. To build on that, so how are they um, demonstrating what they learned? How are they changing their behavior? How are they interacting with standardized patients with their clinical years? For medical school, we have two years of didactic um, content delivered and followed by two years of clinical experiences. So um, what's going on? You know, how do we measure that? Um, how do we measure professionalism? How do we measure the students' interaction with um, each other, with interaction with the clubs that they have available, with the community, with outreach? And then finally, you think of, you know, after the behavior, what are the final results? You know, how do we, um, what are our graduation rates like? How are our students matching with their preferred um, um, professions or their, their, their um, getting licensed? How are they, um, you know, graduating on time? And then finally, you know, you think of this and you go beyond, like uh, Buzz Lightyear, you know, beyond, um, you know, just those, those traditional institutional um, values or measurements. But, you know, we are a medical school within a larger, you know, system where in a community, we're producing students who are going to interact with patients in diverse communities. So how do we, you know, how do our, our, our graduates go out there and interact with the people? How do they help support, um, you know, better healthcare outcomes for their patients? How do they support their communities? How do they um, support the institution? How do they give back to the institution? How do they, um, you know, how are they a role model for other people out there to you know, feed the pipeline from the very beginning? 
So um, there's a lot of different ways we can evaluate what we're doing. And, and that's what we're going to start doing um, this year is, is really to start looking at this and looking at how we can give the lived experience of a very diverse group of students and use that information to help fine tune our um, curriculum um, and look at ways to um, maybe identify some gaps that uh, may exist for certain types of learners um, and create a better experience for them. Maybe create interventions that we can have available from day zero. So they come in, oh, my dog agrees. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I think he hears the chimes. Um, so they can come in, you know, really prepared so that we can, you know, not only admit diverse learners, but really graduate them and make sure that our communities are being served in a way that we want them to be. Um, so um, another question that you can share in the chat or through the Padlet is um, what are some ways that you can identify gaps or opportunities uh, for DEI measurement and evaluations at your institution? And I appreciate the fact that everybody's coming from a different type of institution and you know, medical school is, is very different. Um, but I think there's a lot of commonalities, not just among schools, but other types of organizations as well. So uh, going to mute myself for a moment. That's, that's what I was going to say. So while your dog, I love your dog, while your dog is, is enjoying the charms, um, you know, I was just looking, I do see we have a fellow comm uh, uh, member here from Idaho and um, people from all types of equity organizations and University of Maryland Global Campus and um, others there. Um, but if I go backwards um, to look at question two, and, and you know we can go, Dr. Fairley, whenever you're. Oh no, you don't have to click back though. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm just I, in my mind. We're moving backwards, but I'm looking actually at the padlet. And, Somebody wrote on there about, you know, emphasizing the importance of talking to students. Um, because when you're, when we're doing this, it is, we have to, we, we have to all change. We can't be stagnant. We all know that this is like, we're in such a transformational time. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and, and I just completely agree. The challenge that I find, and in a way, I'm almost going to pose this question back and, and maybe we'll see, you know, what others may think about it, because the challenge is we have to talk to students. And so we are, we've been reaching out, we've been doing roundtables, you know, creating those pathways, uh, making sure it's embedded in the syllabus that we, you know, this is our mission for DEI. We have to have it. And so we need you to talk to us. And this is the pathway. And there's multiple ways for them to do it, as well as, you know, Doug's talked about how we, you we do further evaluations, but you know, the thing about it is we also need to make sure that we are teaching them and you know, and it's it's in an informed manner that they're like the, the dialogue, I guess, is both ways. And so the challenge is, you know, sometimes students feel as though what they know is absolutely the only way. And so we still have to get their feedback while keeping their minds open. And so I, I guess in a way my question would be. How do we make sure we're doing that in, in a good way? And I see Dr. Fairley, you did raise your hand. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, along with what Dr. Cadet is saying, um, stating, one of the things that we did was develop a survey to assess our DEI. And um, it's a part of our evaluation, as Dr. Cox uh, mentioned, that we want to hear back from the students because they're the ones who are, is the next generation, right? So as uh, Dr. Cox said, we do a systems approach where we not only go to the students and say, okay, what is missing from the curriculum? What is what would you like to know more about? Um, what is, what are your concerns and things? And not everything that they state can be implemented. And then we do self-evaluations. As a professor, am I using diverse image, imagery? Um, am I telling the whole story? Or am I just giving partial? When I look at my assessments, I'm, am I removing bias in my assessments and things of that nature? Um, so it's more of a holistic approach that we have to tackle this in order to be successful at it. Absolutely. And I love that, um, I hope I'm saying it right, Yovana, put using curiosity as an outcome. That's very, very key. 
um, extremely key. And I will say through the humanities course, um, it's I've been you know involved with it since we initiated it during the pandemic, in fact. Um, so we're in our second year with it. It is something that um, students do in their self-reflection or perhaps after small group sessions say, they realized they didn't know. Um, they, did, they didn't, I guess they're realizing how much they didn't know and how important it is to just learn about other people. Stu some students have very specifically said, wow, now this is making me more curious to go find out what else is out there. And so that's really, really key. Ivana? Hello, thank you for giving me the chance to speak. Um, you know, when you include um, intercultural competency as an outcome, that really helps as well. It's really a matter of weaving it into your curriculum. And if you're familiar with, uh, um, I don't mean to sound, uh, you know, coming from up there, no, uh, no. are you familiar with intercultural competencies? Absolutely. Dr. Fairley is the director of IPE. Um, and I, I was working with the IP program for about oh, nine years and helped develop it too. So Dr. Fairley. So yes, we do um, have modules in our IPE where we talk about uh, racial, uh, well, cultural humility and religious um, humility. So mm -hmm. our students, and that's also interweaved in what we have, which is known as a primary skills um, a course in which the students are interacting with patients and the, the clinical case may be a patient that cannot take a, a, a blood transfusion for religious regions and things of that nature. And so how do you, um, what do you do in that situation? Do you show empathy to the patient and things of that nature? So a part of our training with our students is making sure that they are culturally competent and religious competent because the patient uh, population that you would get would be very diverse. And so we try to make sure that our standardized patients are not only, um, we just finished an IPE showing the importance of having a medical interpreter as a part of a healthcare team. And the patient came in and only could speak Spanish and that was it. And so our students relied on that medical interpreter and relied on that. And we also do other IPE modules, as Dr. Cadet said, where we uh, talk about religious competency and uh, cultural competency. So our students are very well versed. Um, that's one of the things that, what brought me to PCOM, I've only been here three years, is their DEI initiative. They are on top of it. And uh, to have buy-in from the president, um, from the top all the way down is just phenomenal. I have not seen it at any other institution I've been in. Yes, you sound you sound very lucky. Uh, most of us have to work hard towards that that goal. Uh, I'm just going to share some information regarding including um, uh, you know intercultural competencies in the in the medical field. Uh, the reason I talk about intercultural competencies is uh, we're not just looking at differences in culture, uh, which, you know, we have to accept nowadays, America is not the America that it I was in the 60s, but the, America was in the 60s. Moving forward, uh, you, you know, the nature of the society is so multicultural, uh, our students need to understand that uh, this is a skill that they need to have. Uh, and I also mentioned the curiosity aspect uh, that needs to be included in curriculum for the simple reason that, you know, we want our learners to understand that the information they're receiving is just up to here. They need to know how to go beyond that point. We need to, to, to spark that interest for them to go beyond that point. And that curiosity is with respect to your content. But it also applies to that cultural, uh, intercultural aspect because it's constantly changing, right? Uh, so uh, th that's the next level that we need to take that from. And I think you're in a great position in that you're at an institution which is already doing so much in the AI, whereas the rest of us have to fight to get to, to that point. So uh, you can model that. Thank you very much I, for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate your comments so much. And, and you know, let's be clear. We have to have community buy-in. We all know this, right? And, and we are fortunate here, I will say. 
in that we do this president that Dr. Feldstein has been here since I believe 2014 and, you know, period, we have to do it. However, we still, there are still fights. There's still lots of, you know, um, having to rationalize the whys. And I don't think that's going to end as well as really a shift of mindset to using the term even humility and understand having people understand that, as you just mentioned, they need to remain curious. It's an evolving situation. And, you know, I, I meant to discuss it and I didn't get a chance to say it earlier. I just realized even the creation of my role as director of health equity curricular initiatives, right? That's a new role. Um, and this is my first year. And so I, I piloted certain things in the medical humanities course. And, you know, the beautiful thing about that is, you know, this in this role and it's tri campus, I, one of the things that I need to be doing that I will be doing um, is, is really working across all three campuses to kind of take that siloed information, the IPEs and the, you know, the stuff that they do in the, in the clinical skills courses and some of that other stuff and really try to bring it throughout and have more active learning experiences where they're just really, really constantly redoing this. And, you know, what's interesting, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to tell you, Dr. Fairley, but after your last spiritual um, humility session, our, my students came to me in humanities and said, you know, Dr. Cadet, can we set up a panel um, and find some other practitioners as well as students of other faiths? Because, you know, we have such a wide diversity of faiths, especially on my campus, and have a panel and use that as a community experience for us to learn. Perfect. So what my point in all of that is, you know, I've been able to, I've been fortunate enough to be able to utilize this humanities course as an area for students to explore their curiosities even more in a safe manner, as well as maybe even do a lot of peer to peer teaching, you know, because they listen to each other more than us sometimes, right? Thank you so much for those comments. Let's see. Our Padlet has been um, pretty uh, active and I appreciate that. You know, um, somebody is, is mentioned about, you know, working with Zoom and the lack of, you know, sometimes people's knowledge, uh, you know, with various technologies. And that's an area that, um, Doug, I know you, you, you're pretty passionate about and talk about as well and how we need to meet students where they are. Yeah, I think that's, you know, we really had to be considerate of the fact that not just for students, but faculty and staff as well, mm -hmm. not everybody, um, you know, has the same access. And we found that out at the beginning of the pandemic. I think in our South Georgia campus, we were noticing that a lot of people were really having difficulty accessing online resources and being able to stream um, content. So, you know, asking a student requiring a student to be, you know, live camera on during a lecture just might not be possible, you know, from a technological standpoint, but it also might not be possible from, you know, uh, a point of view where the student might not be in an environment that they feel safe. They might not have, you know, they might be homeless. They might only have, you know, like having to be working from a bathroom or a closet or something like that. So to be respectful of everybody, um, you know, it's, you really have to rethink your purpose and what are you trying to get out of that experience? You know, do you, must the students be there live face, you know, on in front of the camera all the time, or are you trying to have them learn? And that, you know, that can be accomplished in many different ways. Um, and my dog again agrees. So, but you know, <laughs> you just, it's, it's a matter of just, you know, kind of sometimes stopping and thinking, what do I want to get out of this? What do the students need to have? What has to be done and you know what's the bare minimum and how can we let the students um you know or and faculty and staff as well you know um modify the work um in order to get the same outcome yeah i love it um and you know i i have a message here that i think i'm going to read out to a question i'll read out to the community is um, about when in our curriculum do our students take the medical humanities course um, and, and actually I'll expand on that a little bit. So with this revamp of our curriculum, and, and to be clear, we're in year two. So our second year students, um, 
start in July and, and we are now, uh, we're, we're in process of rolling out our second year curriculum of this, you know, uh, aligned curriculum. So it's been a challenge because you're, we're literally running at several curriculums at the same time because for this academic year, second, third, and fourth year are not aligned, but our first year is. And that medical humanities course is a new course in our first year. Additionally, I didn't discuss it, but we do also have a physician wellness course that is um, really to help them also make maintain themselves, really infusing the importance of you know personal wellness in in terms of being able to then project that wellness and, and equity on others. So this medical humanities course is in the first year. Interprofessional education um, at PCOM is all four years. It's, you know, in Georgia, it's actually, it started in, on the Georgia campus. I've been here 10 years and I believe we started it officially 10 years ago and we helped expand it to the Philadelphia campus. Um, and then when South Georgia came, uh, of course, um, it was brought down to South Georgia. And, you know, I'll say the Georgia campuses, um, are very, very strong in the IPE and that it's over four years and really goes out and, you know, partners with other institution and programs. And, you know, Dr. Farrell, we could talk more about that. But, um, you know, our Philadelphia campus is, it's a good program, but we're, we're working to make it more robust there as well. And so um, to really enhance that. And the humanities, while it's officially one year, my goal would be to, um, have these community experiences and really capitalize and encourage the curiosity to have students in subsequent years work with the first year. So it's kind of continuing throughout. Hello, apologies and, for interrupting yep. such a beautiful conversation. Oh, we need to wrap up this session here. I think that there's plenty more to say. We have here, I'll put in the chat, the links to our, um, other social media where we can continue this conversation. Thank you very much for this. It has been an inspiration. Thank you, Monica, and everybody else. Thank you so much. And, Thank you. Have a and, great day. And in this room, we'll have the featured presenter in just 10 minutes. And so, Monica, if you can stop the recording and hand the host abilities back to me.